Good evening. Welcome to a special Remembrance Day edition of APTN National News. I'm Melissa Ridgen. We're taking a look back at veterans tonight, starting with one of Canada's most decorate, decorated Indigenous soldiers. For the longest time, little was known about Tommy Prince and his contributions to Canada's efforts during World War II and the Korean War. It's a gap that's slowly been mended over the past decade. And last August, the government of Canada formally added to Prince's story with a special ceremony. APTN's Brittany Hobson was there. Nearly eight decades after Tommy Prince first volunteered to fight for Canada, a special ceremony was held in his honour. Hundreds came together at Lower Fort Gary to crown Prince one of Manitoba's hometown heroes. We recommit ourselves to sharing this land and to the values and principles that he and his comrades in arms defeated. I have to believe your memory boxes will be filled and you will have more questions and you will be grateful for this amazing service of these people and of our amazing land. The ceremony was part of the Parks Canada program which recognizes people who made significant contributions to the wartime effort. The accolades were heaped on. Robert Falconerette announced the government of Canada has designated Prince as a person of national historic significance. It is an enduring recognition that Mr. Prince had a significant impact on the history of our nation. And for those who are gathered here today, he is truly a hometown hero. But Prince was born in 1915 in Petersfield, Manitoba. In 1940, he volunteered to fight in the Second World War. In 1951, he contributed his services in the Battle of Capion during the Korean War. During his time serving, Prince received a number of awards and medals, including the Silver Star and the Military Medal. King George VI presented him with both honours during a ceremony at Buckingham Palace in 1945. Once Prince returned home, life was not easy. experience came with a heavy toll, uh, a toll that uh, today's veterans uh, often face. Um, and then following that uh, honourable discharge, he finds himself uh, back here in Manitoba, uh, living through uh, also what we've heard, discrimination, poverty and uh, inequity. Prince spent the later years of his life living on the streets in Winnipeg. He died in 1977. Some of Prince's children were on hand for the ceremony. In a short but passionate speech, Tommy Prince Jr. urged all levels of government to commit to helping veterans. It bothers me deeply that I have to stand here and say this. But we got to do something for our heroes. Not only of the Second World War, First World War, but for the wars that they are fighting today. Prince Jr. works with Homes for Heroes, an organization that builds tiny homes for veterans. He hopes to one day see something like this in Winnipeg. The day was an eye-opener for one of Prince's daughters. Karen Braun Prince never knew her father, but hearing stories of his accomplishments gave her a glimpse into who he was. He is a, a great inspiration to many Aboriginal people and First Nations people, and especially to me, well, what a legacy to live up to. <laughs> Brittany Hobson, ABTN National News, Winnipeg. The Congressional Medal of Honor is the highest citation a member of the United States Armed Forces can receive. 24 of those were awarded to Mohawk veterans who played a special role in defeating the enemy. Here's Annette Francis with that story. The sweltering heat didn't keep delegates, veterans or members of Akwesasne away from this historical ceremony. They're here to honor 24 Mohawk veterans. And at 92, Levi Oates is a sole surviving member of an elite team that used their language to fight. I went to school for it and it taught me a lot of things, you know, in uh, Louisiana. The military used Native Americans in their language to communicate between Allied troops. Your mission is to protect the code at all costs. Do you understand me? The Navajo are well known for the contributions due to the Hollywood film Wind Talkers starring Nicolas Cage and Adam Beach. Enemy forces couldn't decipher the language. Oak served in the South Pacific with the U.S. Army during the Second World War. 
Today marks the 150th anniversary of Memorial Day, an American holiday for remembering those who died while serving for their country. New York Congresswoman Elsie Stefanik says she couldn't think of a more fitting time to bestow the congressional medals. For too long, this selfless sacrifice went unrecognized by, by our nation. And sadly, these heroes were instructed not to speak of their important roles in these military campaigns. For many, that meant that the families and friends of these code talkers were unaware of the contributions these patriots made to our country. Today, we seek to honor and commemorate these 24 individuals from the St. Regis Mohawk tribe. Levi Oak's son says his father kept his role in the war secret until five years ago. We weren't too sure when he was going to get it. We were just hoping before he left, he would uh, left his earth anyway, he would get recognized for it. Stefanik says the St. Regis Mohawks are part of a group of 33 Native American tribes that Congress has recognized for using their native language to send coded messages. What seemed like a simple weapon was in fact a powerful tool. It is because of the skills developed by code talkers that our brave military was able to inf infiltrate behind enemy lines and successfully defeat our adversaries. Today's recognition is long overdue. It's about time that our elders and our families um, get recognized today for the valiant efforts that they made to securing the peace, not only in our country or in Akwazesti, but throughout the world. For the whole community, it's a proud day. And at Francis APT National News, Akwazesti. 2017 marked the 100th anniversary of the First World War Battle of Passendale in Belgium, uh, one of the bloodiest battles for Canadian soldiers. To honour this event, Canada has gifted Belgium a monument to recognise those soldiers. An Inuk youth uh, from Nunavut was there as part of a Canadian military delegation. Beverly Andrews from APTN was also there. <laughs> Sixteen-year-old Tegan Anagulalik from Cambridge Bay, Nunavut, is part of the Canadian delegation to Belgium, honoring the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Passchendaele. Only a few people ever get to do this, and um, I think it's a great opportunity to help me, like, to help me understand more about our history and what happened in the past. The young cadet has traveled with the Canadian military to various sites and battlegrounds in the Flanders area. She says there are no veterans in Cambridge Bay that she is aware of and is looking forward to sharing what she has learned with her community. A lot of soldiers didn't return home and uh, a lot of soldiers took their last steps here and I think that they should know that. The Canada Gate was built in Nova Scotia and shipped to Passchendaele, a gift to honor the soldiers who fought and died on the battlefield. We're here today to dedicate the Canada Gate uh, to mark the sacred ground uh, where 16,000 Canadian soldiers uh, became casualties during the Battle of Passchendaele between the 26th of October and the 10th of November 1917. Indigenous soldiers were among the casualties. Stephen Ross, a retired private, is representing the Saskatchewan First Nations Veterans Association and says it's an honour to be recognised. We did lose uh, many, many young warriors here. And uh, the people that never returned, never went back to their homes and families, children, grandchildren that are lying here in these lands, they are the true warriors. They are the true warriors. A hundred years later, shrapnel can still be found in the fields, a stark reminder of the lives lost in the now calm countryside. I think it's important for young people to learn this type of stuff so that they could teach the next generation so the memories days. Once Tegan returns to Canada, she will be able to teach others the horrors of war and the honour of the brave men who fought for all of us. Beverly Andrews. APTN National News, Passchendaele, Belgium. 
We need to take a break, but when we come back, we have many more Indigenous war heroes to honor, so stay with us. Welcome back. The Korean War was the first conflict of the so-called so -called Cold War. On one side, North Korea and the Chinese army. On the other, South Korea aided by the United Nations. The war quickly became a bloody stalemate. It was then that a young Métis man enlisted. Tired of his dead-end job, Leonard Desjardins went to war. Rob Smith brings you his story. Leonard Desjardins spent 14 months fighting in Korea and saw a lot of death. Well, it, you know, it, um, it haunts me sometimes. Desjardins commanded a mortar team. He also was a spotter. He recalls sighting a Chinese soldier jumping into a bunker after firing on the Canadians. Desjardins gave the coordinates to a tank commander. You should watch this when he put a phosphorus 20-pound shell in there. He hit that bunker dead on and the Chinese just flew out of that hole all on fire, just rolling on the ground, killed them all. Desjardins was born in 1931 and grew up in St. Lazare, a little village in Manitoba. He quit school at 12 to help his father work their farm. Later, he wound up in Winnipeg delivering groceries, a job he saw no future in. So he convinced two of his buddies to enlist with him in the army. I said, we could be getting a, a good life in the military. I knew what it was because I was in cadets. And after uh, the payday Friday, we sat in a pub in St. James, Manitoba, and just decided, well, phone in sick on Monday. It was 1951. Desjardins was 20 and off to basic training. He says there were some racist attitudes from other men. He just ignored it, believing it was just a case of jealousy. You know, the officers respected us for, for the achievements that we did because we... We're ahead of everybody else in our, in our training. After experiencing combat together, race was no longer an issue. They were all brothers. We had respect for each other after coming back from Korea because we, we were lucky to come home alive, most of us. We had some pretty scary nights, some pretty terrible nights, and uh, I still dream about them. In Korea, close to 27,000 Canadians served. 516 lost their lives. Fair's website yields no clear statistics of how many Aboriginal people served and died in what is sometimes called the Forgotten War. The war ended in 1953. Desjardins stayed in the military for a few years, finally settling down in Victoria and marrying his wife Dolly in 1959. There they raised four children. He remains active in many veterans groups. As part of the Aboriginal Veterans Association, he is now fighting for the recognition of the Métis contribution to the armed forces. He believes the Canadian government is denying them benefits. Uh, the government didn't even blink an eye. They just wash their hands of it. And, uh, but maybe someday we'll, they'll see something that they, they will recognize for our achievements that we've done. In a few days, Desjardins will celebrate his 80th birthday. Content, he says it's been a good life. Rob Smith, APTN National News, Victoria, British Columbia. We have to take another break, but still ahead, we honor some of your loved ones. Indigenous veterans make up our photos of the day. Stay with us. I hope there's details of... Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. Mac David Shooter was a member of the British Columbia Dragoons during World War II. The Dragoons are an armored reconnaissance regiment still based out of the southern British Columbia. As a trooper, he served during World War II and as a peacekeeper after the war. Send us what you got. We would love to see your pictures. Email them to share at aptn.ca and we will do our best to get them on the air. Well, this entire month is a time to remember and honor our veterans. Here's Annette Francis now with an encore story about a ceremony on a small Ojibwe community on the south shores of Rice Lake. Community members, chiefs and dignitaries gathered to pay tribute to the bravery and sacrifices of those who served. 
With pipes and drums leading the way, the procession marched to Alderville Cenotaph. Among the crowd, Don Smoke. He's just three months short of his 90th birthday, the last of Alderville's World War II veterans. Smoke says he enlisted when he was just 17 years old, but he was held back because he was too young. Then in the spring of 1945, he was sent overseas. It was sad moments. Sad moments. I, uh, I've been with guys, uh, young, young folks from home, you know, laying on our bunk, bunk beds, you know. You can hear them crying at night, they're homesick. Eh? It's sad. War is uh, it's kind of an ugly word, really, and I never want to talk about it. Commemorating those killed in action. During... In spite of the ugliness of war, Smoke says for a young fellow, there was a lot learned. It, it, was, a, it was an experience, you know, all the way through, as far as that goes, because you're learning something a little different every day, and something that I never ha ever had. Uh, training for or anything, you know, but it's army life, eh? For almost 90 years, the community has held the commemoration here, but this year is special. It's the first time a federal minister has come out. The fact that it is a National Aboriginal Veterans Day is, uh, it is uh, such a celebration, such an important opportunity for ceremony um, uh, to, to be here. Uh, um, with the, the chief, but the national chief, the regional chief, uh, everybody knows this is important, and I thought it was hugely important that I be here too. Some chiefs from the Assembly of First Nations also came out to honour the veterans. Isidore Day is the AFN Regional Chief for Ontario. He wants the federal government to pay more attention to veterans like Don Smoke and to the veterans of more recent campaigns. We know that it's not just the, uh, the, the last generation veterans. We know that we've got uh, new, new young men and women that have uh, uh, served in, in the more recent uh, wartime campaigns for this country. And, and again, we, we need to ensure that, that they're taken care of that in issues like post-traumatic stress. The one thing everyone can agree on is it was a fitting tribute to our war heroes this Remembrance Day. Annette Francis, APTN National News, Alderville. Now I look back at a Huron Wendat soldier who was once the highest ranking Indigenous serviceman or woman in the entire country with the rank of Brigadier General. Here's a look back at when he rose to that rank. 30 years ago, a young man from Wendaki First Nation near Quebec City enlisted with the Canadian Armed Forces as a reservist. Two university degrees later, and with his family backing him all the way, Joe Paul joined the regular forces in 1991. Now he's a Brigadier General. I have my own tribal family, but when you join the Canadian Armed Forces, you are joining another larger family. So I feel like I'm really blessed, uh, i.e., you know, I go back to my community all the time. Paul has been stationed across Canada. He served in Croatia, Egypt, and Afghanistan. He is now starting a new chapter, being appointed commander of the Canadian Army's largest formation the 4th Canadian Division in Ontario. <music> Lieutenant General Paul Winnick is commander of the Canadian Army. He says Paul's service is impeccable and only the best generals in the Canadian Army can command a division. There's a rich history, there is a connection with that warrior culture of the Indigenous people and the warrior culture that we foster in the Canadian Armed Forces, and it's part of the Indigenous heritage. Uh, and once again, it's a true meritocracy. Joe Paul rose to the top uh, and to commanding this division because he was the best officer for the job. We're immensely proud of him. This post is extra special for the Huron-Wendat people back home. Grand Chief Conrad Suey traveled to Ontario to watch a fellow Huron-Wendat take command. And to see uh, with my own eyes, with uh, all of our uh, members of the nation, to be here and to, to, uh, to congratulate uh, Jocelyn Paul, uh, Commander in Chief, you know, for what he did and what he's going to continue to do, uh, representing our nation and our First Nations also with, uh, with pride and dignity. The 4th Canadian Division is made up of 13,000 troops. Most of them are stationed in Petawawa and Kingston. Our ancestors, they were all warriors. 
and we shall not uh, lose sight of the fact that our ancestors were the one defending Canada, defending the French colony, defending the, the, you know, the English colony. Uh, our ancestors played a pivotal role. Beverly Andrews, APTN National News, Toronto. Well, an update since then, yet another big promotion. Major General Joe Paul, as he's now ranked, works in the Canadian Armed Forces Policy Branch doing international security. And some news reports earlier this year suggest he could be tapped to be the next Governor General of Canada. We'll, of course, watch to see if that happens. Well, in honor of all veterans past, present and future, Tom Eagle, who enlisted in the Army when he was 19 years old and went up in rank as a NATO peacekeeper in Germany and Cyprus, reads the Veterans Prayer as we watch some of the sights from the Menin Gates World War Memorial in Ypres, Belgium. It's the veteran, not the preacher, who has given us the freedom of religion. It's the veteran, not the reporter, who has given us the freedom of the press. It's the veteran, not the poet, that gives us the freedom of speech. It's the veteran, not the compass organizer, that has given us the freedom to assemble. It's the veteran, not the lawyer, that give us the right to a fair trial. It's the veteran, not the politician, who give us the right to vote. It's the veteran that stands for the flag. It's the veteran that salutes the flag for what he has done for this country. Well, that is your APTN National News, honoring our veterans and our serving soldiers. Never forget the sacrifices that they made and give knowledge to our young ones to that effect. I'm Melissa Ridge, and thanks for tuning in. Dennis Ward will be back here tomorrow with the latest in Indigenous news. Have a great Remembrance Day night. Thank you.